I'd like you to welcome Peter Chubb here, who's going to be a talk on SD cards. Good day, folks. This story started about uh, two years ago when we got some Samsung TVs to stick on the kitchen wall to display stuff from our CI system so we could see what the bug rate was, what the, who, who was winning in terms of the formal methods team and the kernel team as to who's got the most bugs and whether they've actually caught up proving all the code that we've done. Unfortunately, when we put up the Samsung TVs, the browser in those wasn't adequate. It didn't talk HTML5. So I happen to have one of these things sitting on my desk. We bought the Raspberry Pi sometime before to try out for a different project, and that project didn't actually get anywhere, so I had a couple on my desk. So I plugged one of these things in. Performance was appalling! <laughs> and I finally traced that to the SD card. And that's where this started. It turns out that there are a lot of embedded systems that I'm interested in, where an SD card is either the only or the main storage device. They don't have SATA, they don't have embedded flash, all they've got is an SD card. And that means it's vitally important to get things right. And if you just buy the cheapest SD card from the local post office and take a Lenaro image and DD it on, you're not going to get anywhere. As I said, performance sucks. My first thought was, well, buy a faster card. Maybe we could get something like a, you know, a SanDisk Extreme Pro with uh, go faster stripes. And uh, <laughs> my um, battery's died. Okay. And you might be able to get that 95 megabytes per second that they, they, um, they specify. You will certainly pay enough for the extra packaging. So I spent lots of dollars. Fortunately, my employer's dollars, not mine. So sometimes I remember I'm an engineer when I'm not doing workplace health and safety inspections. So the first thing you do when you're an engineer is you pull things apart. Um, here are two SD cards that I pulled apart. The left-hand one was a fake Lynx's chip. Uh, uh, SD card. It was purporting to be 16 gig when I pulled it apart to find out why. It's got an 8 gig flash chip on it. <laughs> Fortunately, they haven't filed off the number. You can't actually see it in the, in, the, um, in the picture, but it's a Samsung standard flash chip. You can get the data sheet off the network and you can see how fast it's meant to go. We weren't making a tenth of that speed. The one on the right is a SanDisk. They've layered everything inside layers of PC board and you can't really get at it. So I couldn't pull that one apart, which was annoying. I thought, OK, if I can get the, S the flash chip off, I can desolder that, stick it in a flash reader, and maybe I can get the firmware out, have a look at it. And I thought about that, and I thought about that, and didn't quite get round to it, because it's a bit more much work, and my eyes are getting older, and I'm not very good at desoldering anymore. But fortunately, um, in December, December last year, Bunny Huang did exactly that. <laughs> and you can get his data there. Um, his code was written for the Novena, so you can plug an SD card of the right sort into a Novena and get the firmware off and do whatever you want with it, and even put your own firmware back on. And that's really nice, and it opens it up, and I'll come back to that later. Because what I wanted to do in the meantime was make my SD cards faster. To be able to do that, you really need to understand what Flash is like inside. This is in all the Flash data sheets, so I'm going to go through it fairly fast. Flash memory... And I'm only talking about NAND flash now. There's another sort of flash called NOR flash. If you want to know about that, look it up on Wikipedia. NAND flash is divided into pages. Internally, those pages are accessed serially, which means that it looks a lot more like a disk than memory. The typical size of a page is somewhere between 512 bytes and 4K, although I've found some which have a page size up to 128K, plus some ECC code. You have to have the ECC code there because Flash is jolly unreliable. And most of the other things I'm going to be talking about are to try and fix up that unreliability. So your page size is maybe 2K plus some small number of bytes. How many did I say? 112 bytes. That 112 bytes is for ECC. Those pages, which you read and write at once, unfortunately they write once. If you want to write a new page, what you need to do is find an empty one, one that's been erased, and write there, and mark the old one dead. 
you can't erase just a page at a time. You have to erase an entire block at a time, which is some number of pages. In this case, this particular one has a 4 meg plus ECC block, but I've seen them up to 8 meg and 16 meg even. And there's a few small ones that have got smaller ones as well. But typically, the class that you can buy off the shelf now have got a 4 meg erase block. What's more, inside that chip packaging, there can be more than one die, or sometimes on the same die, you can have more than one plane. On a good SD card, you can read from one plane and write to the other without going off chip. And that becomes really nice for garbage collection, which I'll come to later. So this is what it looks like inside. Typical timings, and this is the timings for that Samsung flash chip I showed you just now, to read a to write a page, that's a, take, a, take an erase page and write to it, is 200 microseconds. Mm, typical. To read a page is about 3 microseconds. To transfer it to, the, to or from the SD card bus is about 3 nanoseconds per byte. So that's another 12 microseconds on top of the read time. And to erase a block is 3.5 milliseconds. So you really want to do that in the background. You don't want to do it while you're, while you're doing all this stuff. So what we do, what they, they do is inside that flash chip they put an MCU. This one you can't get at, unfortunately. There are about four or five things that MCU's got to do. The first thing is that flash is really, really cheap because they don't waste any silicon. They, when, when you manufacture silicon, there's almost always defects in it. So if they manu they're manufacturing 32 gig flash chips, say, and 80% of those are bad they can throw away all the bad blocks and market them as a 2 gig chip. And the MCU there gives you the, imp the illusion that it's a 2 gig chip with contiguous blocks in it. The MCU also has to run the state machine for doing the arrays and the transfers to and from the SD bus. So that's what all that MCU's done. It's also got a RAM buffer. Uh, because, again, this, this thing's got ser bitwise serial access to the various planes... Uh, and you want to transfer it into bite-wise output. So you need to do some buffering. I don't know how big that RAM buffer is. One of the manuals, one of the data sheets I read suggested it was about two blocks worth. That's two erase block size. Another one suggested it was about two pages worth. But they don't actually state it in the data sheets, which is a bit boring. So, I've said that Flash is unreliable... There are lots of different ways that Flash is unreliable. First, you can get single-bit read errors. They're fixed by the ECC. Lovely. Secondly, you can get bad blocks. Both ones that you get at the time that the chip is manufactured and ones that develop over time because the chip has a limited life. Typically, 100,000 erase cycles before that erase block is dead. The other thing you've got to watch is read disturb. The way that uh, the flash chip works is there's a floating gate in, in the FET that manages each, flat, each uh, cell, and you transfer charge onto that by tunnelling or some other quantum mechanism, um, by raising voltages so that the tunnelling is more likely to happen. Now, it so happens that when you turn off everything else except for the cell that you want to read, you're also putting voltages on there. They're much lower voltages. But if you do it often enough, sometimes some electrons jump onto that floating gate. So if you're reading from this cell here, the cell next door might get an electron on, the, electron on the gate and start reading a zero instead of a one. That's called read disturb. You can fix that by erasing the block and starting again. And you'll pick it up from the ECC being wrong. Which means that your MCU, ins you, you've got somehow to detect that, erase that block, Sorry, copy the data, doing the ECC correction so that you've got good data, copy it into a new page, erase that block, and then start again. So you need another controller. This one is uh, a block diagram from the Silicon Motion controller. The big manufacturers, SanDisk, Toshiba, Samsung, and so forth, they manufacture their own controllers, and it's totally proprietary, and I've got no idea what's in there. Except that I, I've been told, and this is sort of unofficial, that some of the high-end Samsung ones, the ones that do Wi-Fi and Bluetooth as well, have actually got a high-end ARM chip running Linux on it. But uh, I've never actually seen one of those cards, so take that with a pinch of salt. 
What the SD card does is it's got a really, really slow, cheap MCU there, an 8051 typically. They cost maybe 17 cents per SD card, that kind of, that kind of range. And because it's really, really slow and horrible, you don't want your data going through it. So it's got a completely separate data path down the bottom there. What the data path does is it's got the host controller that actually talks to the, um, the, the bus. And that's quite complicated because there are three different modes of talking to the SD card bus. That talks to an SD interface, which interprets the commands that you can send over that bus to decide what you're doing with the card. It's got a buffer. In this case, the buffer is 64K plus a bit for the ECC and other out-of-band data. And it's got a fast so a flash interface that talks whatever you need to do for the flash card. And there are two standards for flash chips. Toshiba's got one and everybody else has got a different one. So most of the third-party flash controllers you can buy will talk either, which is nice. It's also got a hardware ECC generator and check them in there, because otherwise you couldn't do it fast enough. So, so that's the bottom part. At the top, there's some program ROM. That's actually not ROM. It's usually NOR flash to let you do execute in place of 8051 cut things. Not only does it hold the program, it holds some metadata about where on the flash all your housekeeping data is. Because after all, we're moving stuff all around. We've got this great big flash chip there. We may as well use it to hold the mapping tables for where things go and where things are. And we've got a small amount of RAM. That RAM is not big enough to hold all the mapping tables for a large flash chip. So you typically hold those on flash and manage just bits of them in the RAM. So that's what the, the, the SD controller card looks like. What it's got to do is present the illusion of having a standard block device there. So it's got to do all the buffering, all the arrays, all the serial to parallel conversion. It's got to cope with a different block size because it presents a 512-byte block interface and the underlying flash could be... 2K, 4K, 8K, whatever. It's got to give access to the different planes. It's got to do garbage collection in the background. It's got to do the erasing and the reallocation and the flash translation and the bad block management. And blah. Good grief. Lots and lots of stuff. The problem is, you go to the back of the SD card package and it's got all these lists of patents. And a patent is meant to be an inven invention disclosure. So theoretically, I should be able to go to a patent, read it, and find out what it's actually doing. 90% of these ones that I looked up, if they've got any documentation at all, the US patent has got the claims, which is what the people want to protect against, and then it says, this patent includes in entirety this other patent, which is a Korean one, written in Korean, not just Korean, but Korean patentees, <laughs> that not even my friend who speaks Korean could understand. So, I don't know what do they do. I'll just talk a little bit about wear management because it's kind of interesting. There's two basic ways that you can do it if you're thinking sensibly. And some of this has been documented in places like uh, the IEEE conferences. What you want to do is you want to remap blocks when they begin to fail. So when you start detecting the ECC going wrong, you remap it. And the other thing you want to do is spread all the writes across all the arrays blocks so that you don't, um, you don't use any one of them excessively and start making it go bad. In practice, you do both of those, but with one caveat. It turns out that for data longevity, if you've got a, something which has been erased once at manufacture time and write your data on there, it will last longer on the flash chip than if you copy it around and erase it all the time. The, just the, the data seems to last longer. So if you want to have something that lasts 10 years, you want it on a block that's only been erased one or two times. If you want to, you know, just, just keep it around, then, yeah. So for, um, for data that's going to last them a very long time, like the Flash program, assuming that you've got an SD controller that has the, 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 the bomb in it, um, then you want to just keep it in one place. The other thing you want to do is, in order to avoid that read disturb, you count the number of reads and schedule a garbage collection after you've, had, you've hit some read threshold. That read threshold will depend on the chip. Because, I think I've got one more there. No, that's right, yeah. Because manufacturers, the third party manufacturers like ATEAM and so forth, tend to buy flash on the spot market, they get whatever's cheapest. 
And it could be Toshiba one day, Hynix the next, Micron the next day after that. Which means they need to re be able to reprogram those controllers. So almost all of them have in-system programmability. I think people should be fairly scared about that because any time you've got an MCU between you and your data that you don't control the program of, it's a possibility of a man in the middle attack. Uh, and we'll come, back to, we'll come back to that later. Anyway, a fat file system is what you normally get there. Fat file systems are actually a pretty good match to the standard usage of an SD card. Because if you think about it, you stick it in your camera, you fill it up with JPEGs, transfer them somewhere else, erase the card and start again. So you're always writing on a clean card. And a fat file system always writes in cluster size units. And they're always 64K in the, these preformatted ones. And you segment a line the first partition, which means your fat, the fat table, is in the first erase block. And that's pretty nice. And there's a conjecture that I have that some flash controllers optimize for access to that fat, that fat area. Because if you think about what you're doing, you're writing to some erase block somewhere, and you're writing contiguously, and then at the end of the time, you need to update the fat table. So if you're optimized for that case, then your standard use case will be really nice. A fat file system looks something like this. You know, you've got uh, some, a little bit of boot info, at the a boot parameters at the beginning, which has got info about where things are. Then you've got your file, file allocation table. Then you've got your root directory. And then you've got cluster after cluster after cluster after cluster. OK. Remember that graph, because I'll come back to it. I just wanted to mention interface speed a little bit. You've got three modes of access to a typical um, card. You can either access in a single line mode, one bit at a time serial, and for that, up to about three bit per second. Or you can flip to a four bit wide system and talk across that. <coughs> or you can do double data rate and do it both on the, the, the lower bit, the, the, sorry, the rising edge and the falling edge of the clock, which gives you up to 25 megabits per second, megabytes per second, sorry. There's also a standard UHS-1 and UHS-2 and UHS-3, but I haven't actually seen any of those cards, which lets you get up to 104 megabytes per second at double data rate. And that's pretty nice. You'll see these class numbers. Class 2 is 2 megabyte per second. Class 4 is 4 megabyte per second right. Class 6 is 6 megabyte per second. UHS-1 is usually even higher. But there's a caveat. The standard says that the class 2, 4, and 6 gives you that guaranteed write speed even when the disk is fragmented, the flash is fragmented. Class 10 is only when it's unfragmented, which means that for Linux use, a class 4 or a class 6 card will usually give you better performance than a class 10. Okay? Now, the controller's got some RAM buffer. The RAM buffer is smaller than the array size. So a guy called Arndt Bergman did a whole heap of work to characterize flashes. And he discovered that the way that most of these flash controllers work is they keep some number of erase blocks that they're currently writing to. Uh, and that number varies from two up to some fairly large number. The size of that buffer seems to increase with the price of the card. Um, you can tell by reading something and then reading something adjacent to it after a little while and timing how long that second read takes. If it takes a very short time, it's probably in the buffer. If it takes a long time, then it's doing more reading off the flash because of that 12 microsecond delay. Arndt Bergman wrote a tool, Flashbench, which you can get off Git. It's a really, really nice tool. Or it's in Debian, you can just app get install it. And you say Flashbench-A on a directly connected flash controller. If you're using a USB adapter, forget it. This has got to be something that's directly attached, otherwise you won't get the timings. What this does is it reads a 2K block just before a power of 2 boundary, a 2K block that's 1K before and 1K after a uh, power of 2 boundary, and a 2K block that's after a power of 2 boundary. If you're crossing an array's boundary, then the one that comes before will be relatively cheap, the one that comes after will be relatively cheap, and the one that goes across is going to be relatively expensive because you've got to close one allocation unit and open another one. In this case, this is for a Kingston card, you'll notice the one I've I've coloured in red. 
it, you, you've got 300... The, the, the diff at the end is the difference between the middle one and the average of the other two. And it's 350-odd microseconds until you hit 4 meg boundary, when it's 840. So we're, our conjecture is that the evade size for this flashcard is 4 meg. Unfortunately... Um, I lost the data for below 32K. When you look at the small ones, you can work out what the page size is by a very similar um, calculation. You just look at the one with the, where, where there's a jump in time. And that's really nice because we can characterise the cards. Now, normal file systems are optimised for use on spinning rust. Or they're optimised for VAs, like XFS and ButterFS. They do journals, they do snapshots, they do transactions, but they're all really aiming to reduce the seat time on a single spindle. Flash doesn't work that way, so let's take four SD cards, and I got a guy called Mark Johnson to do this as a summer project last Christmas on 2013. So we took four SD cards and tested them on all the file systems that I had available at that time. Here with the SD cards, I've scaled them because they're all different number of gigabytes by the price per gigabyte. The Kingston was the cheapest at 80 cents, the Toshiba Class 10 x series was $1.20 per gigabyte, the SanDisk Extreme UHS-1 was at $5, and, the, and so on. And we found the number of open allocation units. For the cheaper cards, there's two. What's more, for the Kingston class, um, class 10 card, one of those allocation units was bound to the FAT file system area. So that was, that, it was, all, that was always open. And then the other one went away, all over the place. Um, the others had nine, which was quite nice. Now, I tested these in a Sabre light which doesn't have a UHS-1 interface. So all the graphs I'm going to show you for these cards um, have a maximum transfer rate of 24 megabytes per second. First thing we did was IOZone. And the bottom line is price per gigabyte. The line at the side is K per second for an IOZone read test. You'll notice that the, cu the curve is pretty flat until you get to the Kingston one, which goes, goes down fast. That says that even at 80 cents per gigabyte, Kingston is not good value. Right. right patterns. I mentioned before, um, the one on the left is the, uh, was a block trace output for that file system creating a 4-meg file. And it goes pretty, pretty straightforward. The time across the bottom, block number across the right. There's a glitch at about one second. I don't know what that was caused by. Maybe some, Maybe the process got swapped out and swapped back in again, I don't know. But you'll notice that it writes pretty linearly, and then it writes the flat, flat area on the right-hand side. EXT4 writes a lot more. Um, the scale of this is much more expanded. You'll see that the, the, the block number on the left goes up to uh, 1.4 times 10 to the 7, instead of being you know, 10,000. Um, it writes the file, then it writes the journal, then it writes the directory entry, and then it writes the super block with a fairly big delay in between the, the, the last two writes. So, for, um, for ext4, the minimum number of writes to create a file is four. For fat, it's two. Enter another fl file system, F2FS. This is supposed to be the flash-friendly flash file system. It's written by Samsung, so you'd expect it to work really well on Samsung chips. We'll come to that. The way it works, theoretically, is it's supposed to use the on-chip flash translation layer rather than working against it. It's supposed to cooperate with the garbage collection and use those optimizations that were there for the FAT32. So the way it works is it divides the flash into two meg sections. You can actually tune that and look for time. So two meg sections, and each of those will be written continuously as a log with all of the data in the log before opening the next 2-meg section. It always writes at the log head. And those 2-meg, even if you've got a 4-meg or an 8-meg uh, allocation unit, will always be aligned with the allocation units. And that's nice. I'll just go through these. You can read them. I'm not going to talk to them. My voice is running out. All the metadata is written to the fat area, or, or the area that would be the fat area on, the, on a, a fat file system. So if there's an optimization in the controller for fat, this will take advantage of it, which is nice. The other thing it does is it tries to split data that's likely to be short-term from data that's likely to be long-term. So that if you've got data that's going to be right once and then sit around forever, like a JPEG or something, it'll be 
allocated to something that's then not moved later on. It does this by having more than one open two megabyte segment at once. It can have up to six, depending on the, the data that's coming in to be written to the place. There's also NILFS2, which is an older file system. It also is log structured. It uses eight meg segments. It defers garbage collection to a user process. So the user process says what the garbage collection uh, actually, you don't say that directly. You say what the protection period is for the checkpoints, because it continually checkpoints and snapshots the, the data on the disk. Again, all data is in the log, and there's only one write lockers. So let's look at some benchmarks for that one. Here's Postmark. Um, Postmark reads and writes a lot of small files. And as expected, FAT32 performs really awful. The XT4 performs reasonably well on the, on the SanDisk Extreme Pro. And F2FS performs pretty well on all of them. The nice thing is that for the Kingston fire, um, card, F2FS performs adequately. NILFS performs slightly better, but that's a different story again. Anyway, so that's that. Um, I've gone through that. This year, I, just, I, I got an Odroid XU3. It's got a micro SD card. So let's try using that instead, eh? So I bought a whole heap of more things, or my employer's money again, nice. This is, these are the characteristics, I'm running out of time here. Um, you'll notice this time the Samsung Evo Class 6, 6 16 gig cards are really cheap at the moment. The right hand column is the recommended retail price per gigabyte. Um, you can generally buy things a lot cheaper than the recommended retail price. So we use Dbench this time. Um, You'll notice the SanDisk Ultra performs worse than the Samsung Class 6 on every benchmark, so on every file system. The Kingston, the, by the way, these are ordered all on the bottom in increasing order of price per gigabyte. Um, and the Samsung Extreme Pro performs reasonably well, but NILFS performs really, really badly in throughput terms. Uh, I, by the way, I had a protection period of 10 seconds, which is similar to what F2FS provides for these. Uh, typically, you set up to two, mi two minutes or something. Until we look at the latency curve. Whew. Um, smaller is better for these. Kingston's are really, really slow. Um, and NILFS gives you the best latency of any of, the, um, of any of the file systems. So it has trade latency for throughput. So depending on your workload, if you've got a workload that's latency sensitive, you might want to use NILFS. If you've got one that's throughput sensitive, you might want to use F2FS. Postmark write. Postmark write performance, NILFS outperforms them. That's lots of small files. Postmark read throughput, also NILFS is beautiful. But these are all micro benchmarks. How about something that I care about? Like building the kernel. This is a make-j8, all no config configuration. And what we see is that ext4, apart from that stupid Kingston card, performs at least as well as the others, and slightly better than most. Turns out that when you do a make-j8, there's a one thing it does at the beginning that's single, single process. It calls git to get the, um, the, the, the hash of the, the current head of tree. And that actually takes quite a long time. And it seems that whatever access pattern git does seems to work really well on the XT4 and really poorly on the other file systems. And I haven't managed to investigate that much yet. You can also see that if you can spend a reasonable amount to get a Samsung Pro card, it doesn't matter much what file system you use, they all behave equivalent. And in fact, at that point, you're no longer I.O. bound, you're CPU bound. And that's the, that 90, cents, 90 seconds or so is the, almost the same as if you're building from a RAM disk. So, yeah, that's all my benchmarks. There are a couple of other gotchas. Some cards and files have very high latencies. There's another card that I bought that I haven't shown. It was a Samsung Evo 24 megabytes per second card. It took more than 30 seconds to complete some operations. And the MMC driver kicked up its heels in despair and said, Ah, I can't do anything with this. I worked out why it did that. A UHS-1 spec says that at 1.8 volts, 
a UHS-1 card can use up to 2.9 watts, which means it's drawing just under 2 amps. And my poor power supply couldn't cope with that. And that's why it was taking more than 30 seconds. So, watch out for UHS-1 cards and measure their power consumption. The other thing is the Nilefs 2 cleaner can die. I've been running that Raspberry Pi that I told you about at the beginning for now a year and a half on, um, on the Raspberry Pi. And every now and then the Nilefs the cleaner D, the user space thing that does the garbage collection, dies. And when that happens, the disk fills up with checkpoint and then everything stops. It happens maybe oh, three times in a year. And I still haven't worked out why. Um, because when the thing hangs, you can't get into it to look at any logs. And when you um, pull the card out and look at it, it hasn't written any logs because the card's full up. <laughs> so, yeah. So watch out for that one. No file system works well when the flash is full, because then you've got to do kind of lots of best fit allocations in what space is left from everything else you're doing. F2FS is still fairly immature. Um, it hasn't yet been fully optimised for highly concurrent workloads. Uh, and there is, when, when I run it on, well, the, 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 the benchmarks I showed is from an 8-core machine, 8-core arm, arm machine, XE3. And when you run it like that, you do see some locks being highly contended. So there's some work there to do yet. I mean, it's only been in, in tree for, for four or five months. So, yeah. The other thing is that any time you've got a processor there, man in the middle attacks are, post, uh, are possible. Read the blog entry, please. I have... Oh, yeah, and don't trust random cars you find in the street. <laughs> I, I forked the Apotech code and ported it to the Saberlite for standardised SD cards and to the XU3 for micro SD cards. So you can grab it and play with it. There's also in there a debugger that you can download to the card and um, do whatever you want. Poke around, see what's, see what's there, trace the, uh, the, the, the original firmware and see what it's doing. Unfortunately, I didn't find any cards that I could actually hack. Uh, the Samsung, Toshiba and Kingston ones that I had weren't hackable. An interesting other fact, um, I pulled those Kingston cards apart because they've obviously used this to me, they're too slow. And when you sort of scrape off the epoxy that's there, you can read the chip numbers and things, and they're actually rebadged Toshiba ones. But I reckon they must be second class ones because the Toshiba ones outperform them. Either that or they put their own firmware on. So, in conclusion, buy a suitable car for your work. Look out for bargains. You can often, often get something from Apus Auction really, really cheaply. Align your partitions to erase blocks. When you grab a standard distribution like Raspbian or the Lenaro distributions for XU3 or whatever, they're typically aligned not on the erase block for your card, but on a 1 meg or 2 meg boundary. Realign them, and you'll get much better performance. And thirdly, use a suitable file system. NetFS2, ext 4 or FTFS, depending on your card and your workload. Yeah, I've said that. And finally, have fun. Try and attack some of these cards. They're great. And beware of fake cards. Okay. <laughs> Wait for the mic. There's one there. So basically, if, if what you're saying is that um, no matter what's printed on the label, all cards vary and the performance is all over the place and you're never really sure what you're going to get, what is your advice when purchasing cards to get the best performance if you don't know how it's going to perform? It depends, firstly, on how many you're going to be buying. If you're buying you know, more than 1,000, talk to the manufacturer. If you're just buying one, then find a reputable dealer and deal with them directly as far as you possible. I found the cards I buy from Apus Auction are reasonably good. They, they are actually what they say they are, they're not fakes. And again, on Apus Auction, the price, apart from the Kingston cards, which I found to be uniformly awful, um, actually does more or less represent performance. Um, if you've got time and you're going to be de deploying these fairly rapidly, buy samples, try them all out. Um, I think the gentleman behind you was next. Okay, right. 
in that case, down here. Um, I, I was wondering if you could clarify a little bit the, the FAT optimizations in the system. It, it seems to me that with a FAT table, you're reading and writing the same page yeah, yeah. again and again and again. Doesn't that blow the write cycles right out? It would if that's what you were doing. But um, what they do is you've got your, your flash file system, your FAT's there, and what it does is it puts that into the, into the van, and every time you write, it just writes it to there. And then just before, before you pull the card out, it writes it back. How, how does it know when I'm going to pull the card out? Oh, simple. The, the power pins are longer than the others. And it's fast enough. Yeah, because that's only a couple of microseconds. Well, <laughs> I'm assuming... It just slipped and it just disconnects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, by the way, that if you just power off the machine, rather than um, properly unmounting it, you're likely to get corrupt cards. Um, um, who's next? Madam Chairman, where, where, where are we next? That gentleman? Okay, Mike. Yeah. How do you know how to realign the um, two arrays blocks? Oh, easy. Um, first, for most cards, if you assume a 4 meg, you're right. So just make the partition on a 4 meg boundary. If you want to be absolutely sure, use the flash bench tool and measure it. Also, if you, get the, if you look at the original partitioning on the card when you buy it, because they all come pre-partitioned, that will almost certainly be your base block aligned before you start. So just look at that and use that in all your other partitions. Uh, a, a, a couple of kind of related questions. At work, we use um, industrial quality SLC USB sticks, yep. uh, which are pretty expensive. But so, do, does this is it is USB this have the same sort of issues? And does, is there any difference between SLC and MLC in terms of what you've talked about today? Um, yes, SLC has a longer life than the MLC in general, um, in terms of number of erase cycles. But apart from that, the rest is almost the same. It's just that you've got a different interface at the front. Uh, you've got the same problem of man in the middle attacks. If you look at the bad USB papers from Usenix last year, you can see, see all that stuff. Um, yeah. So very similar. They typically have a, a higher power budget and a more powerful processor in them. But, yeah. yeah, just on uh, getting samples and, and, you know, and then buying the, the batch you do want, We've brought, you know, we've taken samples, found a good card, brought hundreds of them, found half of them worked, half didn't. Packaging and externally identical, yep. but not the same. Yep. That's absolutely true. Um, if you read Bunny Huang's blog, he says exactly that. Um, they, when they were building the Chumbly, chip, the Chumbly uh, embedded device, they bought a whole heap of Kingston ones because they were the cheapest supplier and found that uh, they performed really, really badly. And uh, they dissolved them in acid, found the serial numbers, went, and the, all the serial numbers were identical in, underneath the epoxy. Yeah. Uh, and it turned out to be a, a, a ghost, um, gray, gray run on the ghost ship run. Yeah. Um, was there another one at the back there somewhere? Uh, over there, okay. Um, your speculation about the, some, of the, some of the devices being FAT file system aware is correct, more so for USB keys. So what they do is they look up from underneath, recognize that FAT is being used, and change the allocation strategy based on the fact that you're writing mm. FAT. So you'll get a, not necessarily a drop in performance, but suboptimal performance if you're not writing FAT to one of those devices. Um, yeah, that's quite possibly true. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, one down here. Is it... It sounds like yeah, firmware is potentially... Wait for the mic, please. So, so, so it's for internet land. Uh, it sounds like the firmware is potentially an issue with some of these devices. Yes. Uh, it, what's the possibility that you can get access to more directly lower layers within the device and, like, write the driver in Linux land? Yeah, that, uh, that will be a really neat project. First, you've got to work out how to hack the card or have millions of dollars to talk to the manufacturer and get under NDA what they're doing. Um, if you happen to have a card with an Apotech controller, the hack's already done. And that's the one that we, I put the URL for up there. If you don't have an Apotech controller, then try it. Use fuzzing on the programming pins. See what you can do. Um, when, when you're talking to the SD card, uh, there's a, a defined standard. You, you send down command bytes and then the data for the command bytes. Command 63 is allocated to the manufacturer. 
And it's typically that that they use for in-system programming. So try fuzzing it. See what you can do. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and go to Shenzhen and buy dozens of them. <laughs> Any more? Okay, I think we're done. Are we having fun yet? Thank you very much for the talk and it's a small present.